Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship. On this program, Brother Michael Kaler, a teaching elder at Bible Believers Fellowship, will be presenting part two of his two-part message, Christian Fundamentals, the one and only true God. Brother Mike's website is 2 Timothy 2-15.org. That's the number two, the word Timothy, the number two. 15.org, where you will find his audio and video messages, along with his articles and charts. We now join the conclusion of the message in progress. Peter, when we read in the first next verse here in a minute, uh, we're going to see that he is uh, doubting in himself uh, the vision that he had just had. And we find God tells Peter that what he has cleansed is not to be called common. And I said, God repeats this three times. There's a completeness, there's a spiritual completeness. Peter was commanded by God to eat of those things presented. And Peter refused him out of his own goodness. Peter was going according to what the law said. But the law had already been made of non-effect because of what Jesus did. I think that's part of what God's presenting here to him with this thing here. Let's read on. Uh, verses 24 to 29. <clears throat> And the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in, and found many that were come together, and said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gain, saying, As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore, What intent have you sent for me? So Peter got it. Just because it's uh, unlawful for a Jew or was unlawful for a Jew to enter in like this, it's no longer the case. Don't call that person common or unclean. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross cleaned that man of his sin when he believed on it. Cornelius is believing here. Do not call him or common or unclean. He's a member of our family here now. Amen. That's why I bring out here the vessel shown to Peter represented those things that have been called unclean by the law. Peter, being hungry, only saw this as an offering of food to eat. He went up hungry and prayed at the sixth hour. We see, though, that Peter finally did come to an understanding that it was not only food, but represented those that were not of the nation of Israel. This is what it brings out here in Exodus 20 and 6, what we just read. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. If you love God, you keep his commandments beginning with believing on Jesus and be saved, you receive mercy. You're no longer common or unclean. God is the creator of all things. I mean, we looked at how God was in the beginning and before, therefore before the beginning, and we know that he created all things. As Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In Genesis 1, 2, we see that, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now I see God the Father here, and I see the Spirit of God, God the Holy Spirit. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We've got a picture of the Trinity here of that Godhead. God, His Spirit, and the Word. All before the beginning. Anything that was created by God was created by God, without exception. We, um, as Bible-believing Christians, I don't think have any problem at all believing on creation. Um, the rest of the world hates God and refuses to believe his word. Right. They'd rather believe that things were created from an initial thing that was infinitesimally small, which translates to mean nothing, mm -hmm. 
If it's infinitesimally small, it's nothing. You know, it's just a fancy way of trying to say it to make it sound like you're saying something else. It's a lie. You know, who's the father of lies? And that thing think that this everything came into existence when this infinitesimally small thing exploded. Called the Big Bang Theory. Nothing exploded. I want to see that one replicate in the laboratory. I don't care what anybody says. If you can do that there, brother, I'll tell you what, I might start listening to what you got to say. That's a heck of a miracle there. They, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, let's read you know, Hebrews 11.3 here. Uh, but as for a Bible-believing Christian, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Everything physical out here that we see didn't come into existence because of a physical thing. A physical thing has to be put into existence first before it'll start producing out of itself. It didn't start because some little nothing blew up and everything came out of it that fills this whole entire universe now. Like I said, if you can do that, man, that's just, <laughs> that'd be something. It's not created out of a physical thing. Contrary to what people want to say, I, I tried to explain this back in high, high school days. I couldn't, because I mean, how do you explain that? You know, it's, it takes faith to believe it. Yeah. As with everything, though, with the devil promotes, like this Big Bang Theory, evolution, and all this stuff, there's always that little kernel of truth in there, and then there's a whole bunch of lie in there, too. Um, like I said, you know, something that, uh, everything here didn't come about, as I said, because of the physical. It came about because of the Word of God. God spoke it and it came into being. Uh, the world hates God, though, and refused to retain God in their knowledge. And as a result, there's only one other source of information that they go to. That's the devil. Satan. You either got it from God or you get it from Satan. There's no third party in there anywhere like that that's dispensing information to people. It's either black or white. There's no gray area. That's why attorneys hate it so much. They live on the gray area. <laughs> it's either black or white. It's either of God or it's not of God. And if it's not of God, it's of Satan. So they worship Satan. They believe Satan. They have faith in what he's saying. The faith that's going to take them to the eternal lake of fire. Everything that was created by God and regenerates of itself, its own kind. Um, people were born people and they produced people. Trees, like an apple tree, produces an apple tree. A lion produces a lion. A gorilla produces a gorilla. I mean, you go through here and you look at every single situation that comes up and they all re reproduce after their own kind and because God's word says so. That's the way God said it would be. Everything reproduces after its own kind. Here's some other things we were told about God, that God has told him about us about himself. In John 4, 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. That's why we haven't physically seen him. We've physically seen Jesus, who humbled himself and became his man. Well, none of us have, but a couple thousand years ago, there was a group of people that did. But God's a spirit. We won't see him until that point that we're no longer in this corrupted body of flesh. We're raptured out of here, then we'll see God. Until that point, we won't because he's a spirit. We have to worship in a spirit and truth. We have to do it in faith, believing God is who he is, God. I've got enough evidence of what I see out here and his creation and everything else and the stars. I just love looking at stars and plants and stuff. That didn't happen by accident. That was created by God. That's wonderful. Psalm 147.5, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Amen. That's why we can never understand God. Amen. I'm here for a finite period of time, once again, here on the face of this earth. There's no way I can cram infinity into my 
pea brain up here to get even a, a glimmering hope of trying to understand anything about God. I can get with some of the stuff that he puts out here, but I'm only one big bump on the head away from forgetting it. Yeah. Psalm 83, 18. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Amen. There is nobody greater than God. The devil, Satan, Lucifer, thought he could ascend to be above God. And he's paying the result of that choice, of that decision, along with a third of the angels also. No one is above God. I don't care who you are. President Obama is not above God. And that's not even a hard one to understand there. <laughs> but I remember when he was getting elected, they were treating him like he was the most high God. Yeah. Come on. He's a man. Peter did, doubted himself about the things that were being told to him, but he at least had enough sense to tell Cornelius to stand up. I'm a man also. Don't worship me. Yeah. Ones that are like that are full of their father, the devil. Obama included. Every single other one out there like that that thinks he's above God. Amen. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I love this one here. It's a good memory verse if you haven't already memorized it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. God's telling us that. He created us. You're going to walk up to your creator and say, I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> I'm greater than you are. Come on, stick them up. <coughs> Come on. <laughs> I think we're saying something wimpier than that. There. You know, yeah. try to <laughs> go up against the infinite God. Come on. You know, when I was reading this here. I actually got turned around the first time I started reading this. And it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. When I first read this here, and I thought, you know, that's, Kind of true, too. Without me, your ways aren't my ways. You're not going to get it right unless I tell you what to do. So we have to have God there to tell us, instruct us how to do things. I prefer to read it the way it is, but man, you <laughs> turn it around the first time, it just still kind of makes sense. You know? <laughs> I want to take a look here at um, uh, the words uh, that Paul spoke that were given to him as he spoke to the men in Athens, uh, a place called uh, Mars Hill. And uh, after the, all these thousands of years, uh, the 400 some years, 401 years that we've had this King James Bible, people are still walking around as if there's an unknown God. Yeah. <laughs> people are stupid. <laughs> I almost did my SpongeBob thing. You're stupid. <laughs> you got the truth staring you in the face all your life for the past 400 some years, at least out of the King James and good Bibles before that, that you may not have been able to get a hold of because the man, the Roman Catholic Church, was going to keep that away from you because they don't want you to know the truth. Otherwise, they'll see, they'll, people will find out that they're not the ones in charge. But for at least 400 years, we've had an English Bible that anybody could get their hands on and read. And especially here in the last 100 years or so, there's been no problem at all with getting a hold of the King James Bible. Up until about 30 years ago, it's about all you could get a hold of was the King James Bible until they started putting out all this other junk. But I want to look here at uh, Acts 17, and um, we're going to go through this a couple of verses at a time. Uh, 17, we'll look at uh, 22 through 23. Now, let's go ahead and read this together here. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Folks, we do not serve an unknown God. God is known to us. Amen. He's made himself known through these 66 books we have in this King James Bible. You stay away from that, that's when you get into the stupid stitious stuff. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, superstitious stuff. I think I said it right the first time. <laughs> you get away from God, you start looking at things the way you kind of perceive things. And you start counting on things like luck and, well, on Friday the 13th I can't go out or I got a shoulder on my shoulder. I, I can't walk underneath the ladder or have a black crack cross my path. I've got th two black cats in my house. I must be cursed forever here. You know? <laughs> All the mirrors I've broken in my lifetime, it's, it's, I'm done. You know, I've, I've, I've probably got about 600 years left of bad luck left because of that alone. And it wasn't just by looking at them. <laughs> But we have a, a known God, Jehovah, what we had here. Not in the sense like what you have with these Jehovah Witnesses trying to proclaim, because we believe in his only begotten son, Jesus, as being the only source of salvation. His Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into all things. We believe in God. It's a known God. It's not an unknown God. We don't ignorantly worship because we've got his word. If there's something we're ignorant of, go to his word. You'll find it. You won't be ignorant anymore. If you're uh, still ignorant, it's only because you haven't looked, and that's your fault then. Amen. That's where ignorance turns to stupidity. Superstitious. <laughs> 24 and 25, let's read there. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And like we said before, we've seen that God's created everything. Anything that exists was created by God. Even the devil was created by God. It had to be. Uh, anything past that point, I don't, I don't know. I'll find out later on. You know, how the whole thing works out and stuff like that, there, I don't have a clue. Don't come to Brother Mike for that answer. I, I could. I won't be able to give it to you. I'll tell you to pray about it and wait till we're with the Father in heaven and we'll find out then. Verses 26 and 27. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. So um, everything in this earth, all the principalities, powers, kingdoms, and stuff like these governments and stuff, all been put there by God. He said it's even gone, he's, he's de determined the bounds of their habitations and did it before the times were pointed. Did it before it ha happened. He created this earth for all of us to live on. He set it all up for us. He's put these things in place. Everything that happens is part of his plan, including everything that's set up like you know, where the United States is here, where the countries are in Europe and Middle East and India and all the other places. That's all set up already. It's all been established. It's not a surprise to God that, oh, this group of people made a country over here. What do you know? Oh, he knows it. He, he knew it. He appointed it beforehand. Yeah. And he did it that we might seek the Lord, find him. You know, he's not far from us like it says here. He's in our midst today. Uh, scripture tells us that we're two or more gathered together in his name. That Jesus is right here with us. God is here all the time, no matter where you're at. God is going to be with you down there in hell at the same time if you end up there. Amen. There's no place where God is not. 28 and 29. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. You know, there are some uh, beautiful things that are said. And I, 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 I like this one part here um, uh, coming from the, I don't know if you want to call it like the uh, charismatic Pentecostal side. This is one of these ones here where I hear the first part of this all the time. For in him we live and move and have our being. You know, it's just true. It's because of him that we're here. It's because of him that we are alive at all, that we have anything. 
um, we are as offspring. When we're born, and actually especially born again, we are grafted into the family of God again. We all started off that way in the beginning, though. When God breathed the spirit into Adam, and his soul became a, he became a living soul, at that point, we all became his children. He was called to re replenish the earth, reproduce. If the fall hadn't happened, we'd have been here in glorified bodies. The fall did happen, so we're here in unglorified bodies. But whether glorified or unglorified, we're still children of God. Now he's going to spank some of us and have to send some of us to a place he doesn't want to send us to because of our rebellion. It's not his choice to do that, though. If it was his choice, he would never, ever have sent Jesus to die for our sins and pay the price for our sins. But he loved us enough to do so. We serve a loving God. He loves his children. But if his children won't listen to him, they'll have no part in the family of God after the, when, you know, when we're all dealt with after the judgments. That eternal lake of fire was originally set up for the devil and his, and his angels. But if you don't repent, that's where you're going to end up also. You don't repent and believe. Repentance is just a decision, as we're going to see here in a minute. It's not a work. It's a decision to turn away from your ways and turn towards God. And then believe on Jesus and be saved. 30 and 31. And at times of this ignorance God winked at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Amen. So there we go. This is a speech given by Paul in the midst of a bunch of Gentiles. That takes guts. To stand up in the spot here where people are out to stand up and start speaking about things. But if you study it out, people also got chased out of town for standing up in that spot and speaking about things. Especially if you're going to speak about Jesus. You know, that you're trying to attack my lifestyle and my way of doing things. I don't want to hear it. So I'm not going to make, probably not only just chase you out of town, I'm going to carry you out of town in the casket to silence you forever because I don't want that word going out. Paul stood up anyway. He didn't care. And that's our attitude. We don't care. Amen. If the rest of the world wants to attack us, come on. Amen. Be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. You're just doing me a favor. That's right. That's right. He says, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Yeah. Jesus has died on the cross already, he's already been buried. And as we saw here, he's been raised from the dead, giving us assurance that we have eternal life. Yeah. There's no longer reason for ignorance. The act has happened. You can't say, I don't know, because it's recorded here many times over. There's no such thing as ignorance of this any longer. God can't just kind of let it slide. Now, there were people, when he died on the cross, he went down to Hades or to hell, Abraham's bosom and brought those folks that were down there out. They were in Abraham's bosom because they believed in God. Their faith in God was counted to them for righteousness. God could wink at that. They weren't perfect people, but they believed in God. There were others that didn't believe in God, and they stayed right where they were at. And they'll be pulled out a little later on. For a moment, be cast into the eternal lake of fire. They didn't believe in God. That was a different scenario back then before Jesus came down to pay the price. Mm -hmm. He has paid the price now, so you're no longer without excuse. There's no thing of saying, I didn't know. As kids, that's a favorite saying, I didn't know. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't know that. I've no. Never heard that. Never heard, oh, no, I, bet. I may have said it once. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> but God cannot wink at that any longer because that price has been paid. For God to wink at that now is like saying, I gave my only begotten son to die for you just because. It doesn't count for anything. But it does. Yeah. 
It does. Have you believed on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as your only means of salvation, your sole source of salvation? God says, I am the Lord thy God. There's no other gods. Have no other gods before me. Don't bow down to worship them. Nothing like that. I am the Lord thy God. I sent my only begotten son, Jesus, to die for you. I didn't send a million people to replicate that and make that count for anything. I sent one, my son, to take care of it for you. And that's only because you couldn't do it yourself. There are no million ways to heaven. There's no other way but through Jesus and believing on his death, burial, and resurrection to have salvation. We're all going to be judged. And like I said, repentance, I want to bring that up here real quick, that uh, you know, we have to repent. I've, I've, I've seen arguments before that repentance is required for salvation. I disagree with that completely. I see repentance being talked about all the time. You hear arguments about repentance being some kind of a work that you have to do. It's not a work, it's a decision. It's just like believing on Jesus. It's not a work, it's a decision. So you have to decide to turn away from your sins. And you don't even do that on your own. That's something that's prompted to you of God. Yeah. God gives you that. Now it's your choice. Do I repent? Or do I keep on going with the way I think is the best way to go? If I repent, then I turn away from what I'm doing, and I turn towards God. And believe on his only begotten son for my salvation. We're all going to be judged, like I said. Those who are judged at that great white throne judgment will receive eternal damnation, torment, and suffering in that eternal lake of fire originally created for the devil and his angels. And that's because they felt like they could just go by what the law says. I'm going to allow myself to be judged by the law, and I'm going to be acquitted. doesn't happen. The law does not acquit anybody there. The law is there to point out what you're doing wrong. If it's pointing out what you're doing wrong, you've done wrong. The law doesn't forgive anybody. It deals out judgment. That's right. The judgment for this, if you're going to go that way, eternity in that eternal lake of fire. Make your worst day on this earth seem like a vacation. If you end up there. I don't believe anybody here is going there. But anybody out there that's hearing this message on the radio or the internet, that's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. The decision you make on this salvation issue doesn't just affect you in the here and now. In fact, it does just a little bit for you in the here and now. What it affects is what's going to happen to you after you die and are buried. If you don't believe, you're going to end up with that great white throne judgment and be cast forever in that eternal lake of fire. Now we believe on Jesus for our salvation. We believe on his righteousness. Taking in that mercy of God that's given, you know, given us that, that free gift. Our works will be judged also. It'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. Our good works will remain, whatever they may be. And all our bad works will be burnt. But we'll still be saved. We're still going to be with the Lord in heaven forever and ever. Eternal life with Christ. What a day that will be, brother. Amen. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find a wealth of MP3 audio message downloads along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.